Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast, produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob, and I'm exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. And today, I, my return guest is Cynthia. She's a physician's assistant with Summon, Summit Orthopedics, uh, where a place up in the Twin Cities, actually, they have multiple locations in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And today we're going to talk about, well, we got three subjects where we're really going to talk about. And one is whiplash. The second is cervicogenic headaches, which is neck headaches. And the third is just, you know, regular all overall neck pain. And uh, hopefully we can get you some solutions if you have any one of those three. So join us for, for the program. Welcome back to the program, Cynthia PAC, who was last time coupled up with Dr. Ekstrom, but this time she's going solo. Thanks Flying for, solo. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for taking the time and uh, being with us. Today Thank we're, you. We're going to talk about mainly neck problems to the layperson, but um, uh, whiplash, uh, cervicogenic migraines, and just cervical pain. So yeah those three categories. So before we do that, though, would you give a just a brief overview of who you are? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm Cynthia. Uh, like you said, I'm a physician assistant. As of right now, I'm working at Summit Orthopedics. Um, and I mainly work um, in spine care. So Dr. Ekstrom, sure. who you guys met on the last video, he's a PM&R doctor. So um, physical, physical medicine and rehab. Yeah, right. Yep. And so we focus a lot on neck and neck and back pain, but of course, summit, you know, orthopedics covers a whole range of orthopedic conditions. How long have you been there, Cynthia? So it'll be coming up on three years gotcha. that I've been there. And I've, I've been with Dr. Ekstrom the whole time that I've been at summit. Now you have, um, they have multiple locations up in the Twin Cities, which is Minneapolis and St. Paul area, yeah. correct? A lot, a lot of the suburbs. And uh, what is the philosophy of uh, some orthopedics? I mean, if, I, if you were to summarize how they approach patients. Yeah, so a lot of it is based on a, a team approach. So we have the physician and they select their, their team from the patient coordinator to an advanced practitioner. So a PA or a nurse practitioner. And it's really kind of getting that whole team on board to make sure we're not missing certain links in the patient care from, from diagnosis to getting some type of intervention or, or surgery done. And I think the main point of, of Summit is kind of a, a get to yes philosophy. If a, a patient needs something or, or wants something, we find a way to, to get to yes for them. And I'm going to assume that the uh, goal is not to get to surgery if possible. Right. I mean, yeah. right. <laughs> that is definitely the goal unless, you know, surgery is needed. But ideally, if we can do our our best to keep people away. We love our surgeons, but sure. if we can keep them away from them. Right, right. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I imagine, uh, and we'll go over this today, but uh, I think you guys, I assume you have a lot of tools in your toolkit to try and see what's going to work and hopefully uh, get people back to a, a pain-free life. Yep. We definitely have a, a lot of tools and you know, you and, and Brad come into play with therapy is probably one of you know, our, our biggest tools we have to offer can go a, a long way. Um, but yep, from in, injections and, and therapy, medications, sure. to keep them away from surgery if we can. Awesome. Well, the first topic we're going to talk about today is whiplash. And I'm excited about this because I have not seen a lot of whiplash patients. So okay. I, yeah. I, I've done some research on it in the past and I've, you know, I, I've, kind of ran into it once in a while I'd get a uh, occasional patient but I mm -hmm. it wasn't like I don't know do, do you tend to get a lot of whiplash patients we do get a lot of whiplash patients um and it depends on when we see them there are some patients that we'll see in kind of that uh, acute phase of of whiplash within a couple of weeks of a motor vehicle accident 
And there's some people that we will see years past an accident that are still having symptoms. Oh boy. Well, that answers kind of the one question, how long does it last? But so it can last a long time <laughs> if it's not taken care of. Um, yep. Well, I'm going to ask a question, not on the sheet here, but um, so what is the uh, current philosophy about neck braces? Right. You know, the acute during the acute phase. Yeah. So a lot of the times with bracing, um, sometimes people will brace more so for, for comfort, Right. but what comes into play with bracing is, is deconditioning the muscles too. Right. Um, you really need some of those muscles that aren't injured to be kind of recruited in supporting the spine. So if there's not really any uh, fracture or any, you know, bony abnormality that would call for bracing. Uh, we don't really brace patients. And that fits right along with the f- philosophy of what I saw in the research. The, the oh, legs, yeah. You guys are right Ooh. on the mark. <laughs> so um, one down, <laughs> one down. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so let's cause, let's talk about the cause of whiplash or common causes of whiplash. Yeah. So the most common cause that, that people think of is going to be a motor vehicle accident, um, generally a a rear ended collision, but it can whiplash can really come from any type of trauma. So contact sports, you know, football injury, um, falls from a ladder falls from horseback riding. Um, even anything, you know, such as someone on a construction work site and something falling onto them. Oh, sure. So you can get the same type of, of mechanism of injury without, with or without that, that whip mechanism that you think of. Gotcha. So are, are there, uh, certain parts of the population that are more susceptible to the whiplash injury? I mean, let's say if a large head and a small neck or. Right. <laughs> Those classic large head and, yes. and so, people. Yeah. You know? I, run, I run into um, them all the time. Yeah, I know. They're always on the streets. <laughs> um, definitely. I mean, with out getting, I guess, too in depth in, in sort of the biomechanics of it, but yeah, definitely a small neck and a, a large head. I mean, sure. you're in terms of age, I mean, the, the oh, elderly sure. is probably Makes more susceptible sense. to long-term injury, uh, from whiplash injury, just because of the degenerative changes that their spine already has. Gotcha. Um, women tend to be a little more susceptible or, or predisposed to long-term effects of whiplash injury, just because our, our neck musculature is not that of a male's sure. sometimes I know someone's going to flag me for sexism here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the, the younger you are, people think you tend to bounce back better from injury, but there's also underlying, um, kind of congenital abnormalities in the spine that would predispose someone to uh, worse injury with whiplash. Yeah, it's funny. And as I get older, it's interesting from, I'd say from age 40 to, and I'm above my sixties, um, that my neck has gotten smaller, you know, <laughs> collar and obviously not as strong, you know, so yeah. not as well protected. So what are our common symptoms of whiplash? What, what, what do people describe? Um, definitely neck stiffness. Um, a lot of the times the, the neck stiffness is going to start kind of at the base of the skull for most people. A lot of the times kind of radiate out through, radiate out through that trapezius muscle. Um, a lot of people describe it as sort of a coat hanger distribution. If you were to take a coat hanger and put it on the back, it runs right along oh, that. Yeah, tree. sure. Um, headaches are, are definitely going to be a common symptom. And then sometimes people can get blurry vision, difficulty with concentrating, and sometimes even pain, numbness, tingling that will go into the arms or, or fingers. You know, you quite do uh, you hear this quite often. Now, I don't know if you see this quite often uh, that the symptoms or effects can be delayed, like 
that happened today, but you don't feel anything for a week, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. You find yeah, that that's too? definitely true. It is. I think the majority of people at, I'd say, maybe three days or so are going to be when they start to notice a lot of that stiffness. Gotcha. I think one of the one of the reasons is you after an accident, any type of trauma, again, right. whether it's a motor vehicle accident or you fall off a ladder, there's some degree of adrenaline right. that you're going to produce. Underst understood. And that's going to definitely mask the, the symptoms that you are having. And then the other part of it too is once in, inflammatory, you know, mediators are released in the, the body, it takes some time for your body to, um, really signal what's going on. Right after last year, Dewey, we talked about the bracing or not bracing. Uh, what activities should you avoid? Definitely any anything that, that mimics the type of trauma you were in. And I, I think for most people that would go without saying, that's probably the last thing that they wanna do. So avoiding contact sports, avoiding any aggressive, movement. So a heavy lifting, um, exercising, things like that. It's really kind of a time for, for rest and healing for the muscles. What I would tell most people is to not freeze yourself. Sure. Um, you can, I guess, freeze yourself with using some ice and things like that, but uh -huh. don't just stop completely moving. Um, it, it's kind of more gentle, gentle movements that are going to be best. Right. Hopefully movements that don't irritate it too much, I assume. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I take it, I'm assuming in most whiplash injuries, you, you should see a physician. I mean, uh, I, will, I wouldn't try to treat this on your own. Yeah. And that's the hard thing because there, there's a lot of people that say, oh, you, you, you just got whiplash injury. It's just a muscle strain. You'll be fine. And then we see them six months to a year down the road and they're still not getting better. I, I think if you're able to afford, you know, I know healthcare these days is expensive, right. but if you're able to, to get in and get evaluated, the, the sooner, the better really. Yeah, because uh, I mean, there also could be semi serious injuries, there could be a fracture. Mm -hmm. uh, and there could be a disc problem and uh, who knows what else but so I think you do want to rule those things out. But so what treatment protocol, if you want to maybe call, take a typical patient comes in, if there's a typical patient, uh, what, what, how do you approach that type of patient? What treatment do you start with and what do you maybe progress to? Yeah. So I would love if there was such thing as a typical patient. <laughs> no <kidding>. So nice. <laughs> Classical. Uh, yes. But really if it, it depends the extent of the injury. So, you know, they say you can even get a whiplash injury between five and 10 miles per hour. If it's a, oh, wow. if it's a significant, um, fall or motor vehicle accident, you know, we'll usually want to get some x-rays, make sure there is no fracture, fracture, dislocation, anything like that, um, that would warrant more urgent care. And a lot of the times it's going to be dependent on when they're presenting. So if it's within that first couple of weeks or kind of that acute phase, you know, x-rays and maybe starting them in some type of, of therapy or rehab program is going to kind of be key. Um, Anti-inflammatories, ice, um, sometimes alternating with heat, those more kind of conservative care options. Sure. If it's at the chronic phase now, and so they're, they're months past the incident and they're still having symptoms, a lot of the times we'll jump right for advanced imaging. Gotcha. So MRI or, or, or a CT. What might you see on that? I mean, what might be the problems that are causing this chronic pain? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, and that's kind of an interesting question because sometimes 
injury to, to joints or the facet joints in the cervical spine don't necessarily show up on advanced imaging. But things that we can see that might be the problem would be a, a disc herniation sure. causing, you know, a nerve to get pinched, um, sometimes inflammation in those joints or inflammation in some of the ligaments or soft tissues we might be able to see depending on, you know, again, how far out they are from their accident. Uh, what is it, maybe from a uh, medicine standpoint, what might you start with? Uh, from medicine standpoint, we always start with over the counter you medications. Do. So very, very good. Yep. Um, anti-inflammatories. So anything in that kind of ibuprofen family, Aleve, um, ibuprofen, also Advil, um, and then Tylenol. Do you, uh, try, a? uh, a short lived bump up of the anti-inflammatory. Like I sometimes see the, the doctor recommend, you know, like a 600 milligrams for three days or, you know, just a short time. And then they'll, you know, take it back down again. Yeah. So, uh, we'll definitely sometimes do maybe a seven day, um, sometimes even a 14 day course of like a higher dose of naproxen. All right. um, which is also a leave. And a lot of the times, yeah, we don't want them to continue on that higher dose for an extended period of time, but sometimes we'll do that and, and then just even take it away completely, just kind of give them the bump. If we do any prescription medication, we'll take an anti-inflammatory approach and sometimes do a steroid oh, um, sure. and very similar, the steroid for, you know, five, six days kind of decrease the inflammation, get people moving a little better. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, they could maybe start functioning. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. When do you start physical therapy then usually? And uh, what does the physical therapist start with? Yeah. So generally um, what we've seen physical therapists start with is going to be kind of um, more passive range of motion. Um, and then a lot of uh, soft tissue work. So, um, myofascial release. So trigger points or muscle knots, things like that. It really depends on, you know, how sensitive the, the patient is and everybody is so different in terms of what they can or can't tolerate. But I would right. say a lot of the times, and I don't know from your experience, a lot of the times we see more of that passive range of motion, um, and kind of, uh, setting up good posture again, getting the correct curve of this, of the spine back and things like that to prevent future injury. Always important posture, isn't it? Always uh, important as I'm, as I'm currently. I'm trying to work on it myself. I know. Uh, but when you say passive, just for the audience, because they mean, oh yeah, passive range of motion, if you would describe it. Uh, yeah. So, so passive range of motion is, is basically moving, having someone else move a body part for you. So instead of having you as the therapist, having me, you know, turn my neck, you'll turn my neck for me, find kind of my limitations or deficiencies there. And, um, and, you know, not necessarily adding weights or anything like that. Sure. Right, right. So the next step would probably be active range of motion where the patient performs the motion themselves. Yep. And then on to, you know, and then once the, the pain is decreased, the range of motion is improved. Um, next step would be adding some of those strengthening exercises, um, to, to sort of reinforce, reteach your, your muscles, what they should be doing. So, so uh, are you able to describe some of those strengthening exercises or are they, are they isometric or isotonic or yeah, a lot of the times uh, isometric exercises can be really beneficial um, in not only just post whiplash injury, but a, a lot of other injuries too, especially even thinking of the, the low back doing isometric um, planks, such as for core strength versus doing, you know, crunches and everything that would necessarily put more strain on the spine. Um, for for cervical, for whiplash injury, you know, some isometric injury or some isometric exercises would be 
so you're you're trying to contract a, a muscle basically without moving it right um, understood and so for the neck such as if you you kind of place your hand on your your head and you try to push your head back and really what you're doing with your your neck muscles is trying to resist yourself pushing so you're contracting those muscles and those can be really helpful because then you avoid kind of wrong wrong movements of the necks and o- overuse of the muscles too and you're getting a nice symmetric use of that muscle and would you go in all directions or is it mainly the anterior the musculature in the front that's been damaged and that's the one that we want to strengthen or or do you go work on the back and side and yeah so i would i would definitely go in in all directions i mean the human body symmetry is is key and one of the, and one of the biggest things is having that true evaluation with a therapist, because they can really see, you know, maybe your injury is on one side more than another, maybe you're deficient on one side more than another. Um, And sometimes, you know, you might have to strengthen one side more than the other. And and just having that evaluation is so beneficial. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Stuart Bigel, I actually mentioned him last time, he's a physician out of uh, a doctor out of um, Ontario, Canada, I believe. Oh, yeah. And he, the way he recommends strengthening is you take your two fists, you put it underneath your chin, you take your tongue and put it to the roof of your mouth, and you tighten up the muscles in the front, and then mm-hmm. you push up with your your fists, but don't allow you know the chin to be moved up. Mm-hmm. So, and that is supposed to strengthen the neck muscles without sheer force on, huh. the, on the on the vertebrae. I mean, he studies everything and he yeah. has several textbooks. So I thought that it was interesting. That is interesting. So let's say um, someone gets to, uh, you're just not getting better with somebody. Are there some other options? I mean, they're, if their whiplash is just not getting better, is it maybe more injections or what are we looking at at that, at that point? There are a plethora of options um, from, I mean, mainly from our standpoint, mainly injections um, that would supplement, you know, physical therapy, but the injections can go anywhere from very conservative. So doing something like trigger point injections, which would be, you know, attacking what people know is kind of muscle knots um, all the way up to you know, a little more invasive injections, like steroid injections for the neck, um, sometimes, and we can even get into this a little more in depth, but radio frequency neurotomy. So heating up or ablating nerves that supply some of the joints that may have been damaged in the neck. Sure. I mean, that's what it's nice to know that there's, I mean, you go through the uh, normal routine and if it's not working, there are other options. So yeah, uh, when you say injections, are those guided by x-ray or imaging or are you just shooting for the joint or how does that work? Yeah, we just shoot for the stars, man. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no um, trigger, trigger point injections or things like occipital nerve blocks, those are, are usually blinded or done on palpation. So finding gotcha. the right landmarks, um, all of the, the spinal based injections. So yes, the radio frequency epidural injections, those are all guided with x-ray. And then, um, they use fluoroscopy, which is just basically putting some, some dye and you can see it on the x-ray. It shows kind of a confirmation of, of where they are anatomically. Good. Yeah. Uh, so with the radio frequency, is that what done with a probe too? Yep. It is. Okay. Yep. So you actually are going into the, into the joint itself. To... Well, they do, they do it with, uh, well, it's considered a, an RF needle or a radio frequency needle. So they oh, set God. it, they're actually setting it right on top of the joint where a subset of nerves or the medial branches 
sit and they kind of sit on top of the joint and and they're the main source of pain, pain. essentially right. pain sensation to that joint. I know when we were talking about um, the intercept yep. technique that they actually go through the pedicle and I mean, they're staying away from the nerve roots and stuff. They're not yeah. even close to those, I think. Uh, Correct. Yep. And yeah, for the intercept procedure, we're, we're basically getting into that larger vertebral body. Um, and right. then for this type of radio frequency, we're staying on the, the outside of that joint. So gotcha. we're not actually going into the bone. Gotcha. Okay. Um, is there any time that it proceeds to surgery? Yes. Um, if there's some type of radicular symptom, so nerve pain going into the, the upper extremities, um, and some type of deficit. So weakness and, and things that aren't getting better with therapy, or if we've tried injections, you know, those are people that we will get off to our surgeons. And sometimes, honestly, it's nice to just have a surgical opinion sometimes sure. just during treatment so that patients know if you're not getting better, this is potentially what we're, we're looking at. I know it's off the top of your head, but percentage wise, people that end up being that far along, um, do you have a number or a percentage? I mean, is it 10%? Is it 5%, 1%, 20%? I'd say maybe, I guess out of, out of people I've seen, I, I'd say maybe 10, 15%. Okay. Yeah. Especially if a disc is involved or... Yeah. Well, and that's the hard thing too, is it, it de depends what, what their spine looked like be, before maybe this incident. So maybe they already had cervical stenosis or, or narrowing around that spinal cord, and then they have the, the incident and it's much more narrowed and now they're at risk for a spinal cord injury. So, you know, getting them off to surgery in that case would be more sure. prompt than, you know, someone else. Now, I got to imagine that osteoporosis plays a large role in this too. I mean, mm -hmm. well, do you have anything else on whiplash that we should cover? I think one of the important things to point out about whiplash injury is let's say you're a 35 year old male, you had a motor vehicle accident a year ago, you're still having pain, you've done chiropractic care, physical therapy. Um, and it's just not getting better. And let's say we do an MRI and we get the results back and they are pristine <laughs> and, you know, patients get really frustrated because they get the results, you know, in their right. my chart and they read it and it yes. says unremarkable, normal exam. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean that those joints in the spine aren't playing a significant role in your pain because there are microscopic changes to that joint capsule that aren't necessarily imageable. Um, so I tell people, you know, don't get discouraged or depending on who ordered the MRI, if they come back to you and say, uh, there's nothing we can do, it's normal. Um, there's definitely more that can be looked into. Yes, there's always hope. There's uh, always yes. hope. Yes, I think with whiplash, I, I would like to just ask, you know, do you have what do you, is there a, a certain treatment they feel it has been the most successful for you? A treatment that has been the, the most successful in your whiplash patients? I mean, do you feel like this is the one go-to thing we always go to or? There is a lot of variety. I would say the main treatment that is an intervention would be that radio frequency neurotomy or the treatment at oh, those good. cassette joints. That would probably be the most common treatment for whiplash injury that is not necessarily involving, you know, a disc herniation or, or, or a fracture. Sure. No, that's awesome. I, uh, I was hoping for a response like that yeah. because I wasn't aware of that. And um, what a nice option for people, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, definitely. Yeah. And upon that excellent advice, I think we'll call it to an end, bring it to an end here. Uh, I really appreciate you coming by again. 
Cynthia, <laughs> and and hopefully we'll see you maybe and Dr. Ekstrom again soon. And yeah, we we appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. <laughs>